Great, welcome back. We're in the third part of the lecture now, and we're going to be talking about the Kippen climate classification system. Good old Vladimir Kippen. Vladimir Kippen was a um, meteorologist and a climatologist and a general natural scientist, uh, I don't know, late 1800s, early 1900s. He lived in Germany. He was actually Pomeranian, uh, which is an ethnicity in uh, eastern Germany and um, Poland now. Uh, Vladimir Kippen is a guy who was studying climate, um, and Vladimir Kippen wanted to find a way to describe the large-scale climate of a region. Um, this was not a trivial academic pursuit in, like, say, the 1880s or something like that. There were actually a lot of ways this could have been done, and a lot of people were trying to find ways. How do you describe the climate of a region? See, that was a big era in the age of colonization. And, um, you know, let's say you went off and you decided to claim some territory in the name of the King of Belgium, which sadly was going on a lot in places like Africa and Indonesia and so on at that time. Um, you, went off and you, you went off and you claimed this territory in the name of the king. All right, you don't just do that. You do it for a reason. You want to make, you want to exploit, you want to use the resources of an area. What can you do with this area? Well. How do you decide what you can grow in this new colony of yours? Well, you need to know what climate the region has so that you can decide, oh, this is going to be a good place to grow spices, or this is going to be a good place to grow cotton, or something like that. Well, Kepin realized that you don't want to sit around waiting for 30 years of standard meteorological observations in order to then decide, oh, this newfound land that I claimed in the name of my king will be great for growing cotton. What he really wanted to say is, how do you just show up at a place and decide what you can do with it? And Kippen realized that you don't really want to take 30 years of these kinds of observations in order to um, describe the climate. More importantly, scratch that word want to, Kepin realized you don't need to take 30 years of observations because plants are already doing that for us. Plants that live in a location are already in many ways a type of measure of the climate of a region. Plants live where plants can live. Plants decide to thrive in a place they don't decide. I mean, they're able to thrive because the climate is right for that kind of plant. I mean, let's say we're talking about palm tree. If, if a palm tree lives in a particular location, there are things that you can say about the climate of that region. If you were abducted and taken away to some place, they take off the blindfold and you see palm trees, you know you're not in Canada, right? And you know you're not in England, and you know you're not in Switzerland, and you know, I mean, palm trees tell you something about the climate of the place you're at. Palm trees live in places that get a certain amount of rain, not more and not less. There's not palm trees in the middle of the jungle, there aren't palm trees in the middle of the desert. It tells you something about the temperature of the location. It clearly doesn't freeze there because palm trees can't survive being free to freeze. Just going someplace and seeing the palm trees live there tells you actually quite a lot about what the climate of a region is. And what goes for a palm tree would also then go for, say, an acacia tree. An acacia tree lives in certain kinds of environments with a, um, you know, in monsoon regions, for example, where there is a lot of precipitation at one time of year and then a dry season. Acacia trees thrive in that, but they don't do well if there's a freeze. So they're clearly tropical locations that have a monsoon type climate. Great. Uh, knowing, showing up at a place and seeing an acacia tree tells you a whole lot about the climate of the region. And that goes too for an oak tree. Someone takes the blindfold off, the kidnappers take a blindfold off of you and you see an oak tree, you know, okay, oak trees don't thrive in places that don't freeze, they don't thrive in places that are ice caps, they don't thrive in places that are permafrost tundra. Um, you know a lot about the climate already just by seeing that there's an oak tree there. And the same that goes for an oak tree goes for, say, a stand of aspens. Aspens grow in certain kinds of environment, um, typically like um, highland climates where there's a, a big, uh, you know, severe winters and they, they survive deep snowfall quite well and so on. Um, you see aspens, you know you're not in Hawaii. You know you're not in Florida. You know you're not in the Sahara Desert. There's only certain environments aspens do well in. And the same goes for, say, a stand of pine trees. 
okay? If you uh, find yourself surrounded by a stand of pine trees, you know you're not in the middle of the Sahara Desert, you're not in the outback, and you're not in Antarctica. There's only certain kinds of climates that support a pine forest. Now, it's a big deal to sort this all out, but that's kind of what science of the late 19th century was, was, you know, fiddling out, and not just trees, but, you know, cactuses and succulent plants and different kinds of grasses and so on, to describe, well, how do they survive? Do they, do they thrive if it's this warm? Do they thrive if they get this much precipitation? Do they thrive if they get this little precipitation? And so, this was kind of what Kevin was trying to figure out. And in some ways, you might already kind of had this idea about this connection. Apologize for the jet that's taking off right here. Uh, you, if you have a garden, you probably actually kind of already had this idea about the connection between plants and the climate of a region. I mean, this is a standard USDA plant hardiness map that like shows the different climate regions. If you want to grow roses in your garden, you need to make sure you know which that you're in climate zone five or whatever, and you can only get roses that will survive in climate zone five or hardier. Okay. Uh, whereas, like, if you wanted to grow, I don't know, a different kind of plant, uh, you want to make a persimmon tree in your backyard, you make sure that you have the right climate zone. Uh, you know, you have the right hybrid of the plant to survive in your climate zone. Now, this kind of idea is actually the, the other way around. I mean, a map like this of this hardiness of plants tells you, based on the climate, what will grow there. Kippen figured out that it works the other way around, too. Based on the plants that are growing there natively, uh, you can say a lot about the kinds of climate that the region must have. Now, that, that's not to say Kippen was entirely right about all this. I mean, there are some problems with the Kippen system. I mean, for example, it is relevant what the climate is over water. Uh, we need to understand things like the average temperature, the average uh, precipitation that they receive over areas of the ocean, but there's no plants there to help us know that. Um, plants thrive or fail for reasons that don't have anything to do with climate. For example, invasive species might take over, or there might be fires, or there might be insect damage, or something like that, that might change why a plant can and can't live in a particular reason. There's also no particularly easy way to use this Kepin system to sort out why a plant doesn't live there. I'm reporting to you right today from southern Indiana. I don't see any palm trees around me. But to be honest, I'm not entirely sure why there aren't palm trees in southern Indiana. I mean, it's probably too cold. But it might also be because maybe it's too moist or it's not moist enough. I actually don't know. And neither would have Vladimir Kippen. He would have wondered too why there aren't palm trees here. So it doesn't really sort out what it is that is keeping a particular plant from living in this region. It's also not all that easy to quantify the system. Uh, I'm surrounded right now by a bunch of oak trees, but I can't exactly say this is a 2.5 oak tree environment or climate or something like that. I can say a lot about, gee, I'm clearly in an area that supports stands of trees, oak savannas and things like that. But um, why? And how to give it like a quant? Does that tell me the average temperature here is 75 degrees? And it, you know, it doesn't tell me anything like that. So it's, uh, there, it's not that Kippen uh, had solved everything, but it turned out to be really useful. Now, before we move forward, I want to throw a vocabulary word at you, just because this is going to keep coming up as we talk about these climate regions. A powerful vocabulary word to help us with here is biome. A biome is a large, naturally occurring community of plants and animals that occupy a major habitat. Biome is a vocabulary word that like, you've almost certainly learned in like grade school, but probably forgot. I mean, little kids are all about biomes. They learn all kinds of examples of biomes, like deserts and swamps and forests and ice caps and tundra and prairies and so on. Um, my my five-year-old is nuts about the magic school bus, and it seems like Miss Frizzle on the magic school bus uh, show is always taking them to a different biome, okay, where they learn about the creatures that live on the prairie or the creatures that live on a tropical atoll or something like that. We're going to use this idea of biomes when we're describing these different uh, climate zones because they're, they're terms that you're familiar with. Words like desert. Okay, we, we can describe a climate region as being a desert. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, we're actually going to use a lot of biomes to, as a way of describing these different climate regions. Now, the Kippen system <laughs> is stereotypically German. Uh, it, it, is, it, it breaks down the climate of regions into lots and lots of different categories. If, if your stereotype of Germans is that I, used, I work in Germany sometimes, uh, I used, part of my job used to be in Germany, and I can tell you that it's true. 
they, there's something about their schooling system and stuff like that that really teaches them to be very uh, stamp collecting oriented, right? I mean, they have lots and lots of categories and so on. And the Kep, full Kepin system actually describes every location on Earth in terms of three letters that describes their climate. Oh my goodness, and it's very obsessive. It gets all detailed about the difference between wasteland versus short grass prairie versus, okay, we're not gonna worry about all that. Rather, we're gonna find out that the first letter of the three letters that they use to describe different climate zones in the Kepin system is, we're gonna use that first letter. So like, for example, even though if you look at the map closely, you'll see that there are type AM and AW and stuff like that climates, and each of those AMs, in fact, have sub, you know, AM1 and stuff like that. No, just word A. We're going to learn about type A climates, which are tropical moist climates, or type B. Again, if you look at the map closely, you'll see that there's type B, S, Ws, and B. No, B. We're just going to have type B climates, and we're going to go through type E, and then strangely it skips to H. Um, but you do actually have to know them by letter. In general, I'm not nuts about memorizing things like that, but actually, because some of our test questions are standardized and stuff like that, you do actually have to know these by letter. So let's kind of start working our way through these. Now, the type A climates are the tropical moist climates. They're the ones that are highlighted in this map that I have behind me here. And there's a number of different types of type A climate, but broadly all the type A climates are gonna be tropical and moist. These are gonna be things like jungles and rainforests uh, associated with the ITCZ. Uh, places where there's no real winter and uh, there's pretty much precipitation year round. Okay, um, none of the plants in a, in a type A climate have to worry about freezing and they all have plenty of precipitation. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean they get, a, 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 the, some type A climates are actually more monsoon climates where they have to be able to deal with um, the fact that there's a dry season and a moist season. Uh, some of them are gonna be things like savannas. A savanna is a tall grass prairie. I mean, we're talking tall grass prairie here. Uh, think like a National Geographic special or an episode in Nature where there's like these tall grasses that tigers and, and elephants and stuff are hiding in. Uh, big chunks of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa would be examples of type A climates, etc. If I were to look at a map of the United States and try to find areas of type A climate, the continental United States doesn't really have a lot of type A climate. In the United States, really, our only area with type A climates would be extreme southern Florida. Uh, the Everglades, for example, have a type A climate uh, where it never really freezes and there's uh, plenty of precip uh, there's no shortage of water. The plant, n there's no plants out there that can't live in the Everglades because there's not enough water. Okay. Um, even though the Kepin system is primarily described in terms of the plants that live in a region, let me give you a good clue as to how to determine if a region, when I describe a region, how would you know if it's a type A? A good hint is that if an elephant can live there, it's probably a type A climate, okay? Jungles, savannas, monsoon regions, etc. If you can picture an elephant living there, it's probably a type A climate. Let's compare that to our type Bs. Type B are the dry climates, the hot and dry climates. In terms of land mass, type B climates cover the most area of any of the climate types. They spread across uh, like the Sahara Desert, the Gobi Desert, the Outback, the Atacama Desert, the Kalahari, uh, much of the Southwest United States, much of the Rocky Mountain area, Western uh, parts of like South Dakota and, and North Dakota and so on. There's actually two different kinds of, of main type B climates. One are the so-called true deserts. This is what you're picturing when you're thinking of a desert, right? Blowing sand, dunes, practically no plant life, scrubby stuff, um, gravel, stuff like that. Uh, maybe things like cactuses and stuff living there, other succulent plants that are very good at conserving water that can live on practically no water at all. These are certainly good examples of type B climates, but so are steppes. Step might be a word that you don't know. Again, good biome, right? Jungle was a biome. Rainforest was a biome. Savannah was a biome. True desert was a biome. Now we're talking steppes. Steppes are a short grass prairie. Okay? There's generally little to no tree coverage in a steppe. Uh, at best, like patchy areas of trees. They tend to have short uh, uh, grasses. They tend to have a lot of fire in their natural state anyway. I mean, man is pretty good about making sure there aren't a lot of prairie fires, etc. Um, yuccas grow in steppe. Um, they're just grasslands with short grass. Think like a, a buffalo could roam. That's generally steppe. Um, 
If we look across the map of the United States here, you can see that type B climates are very dominant in the western United States. Um, some of that is true desert, especially in like Arizona and New Mexico, but um, most of the type B climates are actually steppe in the United States. Uh, we're talking like West Texas, the Panhandle of Oklahoma, Utah, much of Colorado and Wyoming, especially Eastern Colorado and Wyoming. These are going to be steppes. They're type B climates. Um, type B climates are pretty darn dry. Generally speaking, the native plants have to be able to deal with the fact that there's relatively little precipitation and it varies a lot from year to year. They need to be able to thrive with limited water. Um, now, in some cases, it's a fairly large amount of water. I mean, okay, yeah, the Sahara gets relatively little precipitation. The Atacama Desert might get no precipitation in a given year. But, you know, West Texas might get 15 inches of rain a year. 15 inches is not bad. But the thing is, it's a relatively warm climate. Most of that precipitation that they get in that 15 inches is going to just evaporate. It's warm, the water evaporates. Even if they get a fairly large amount of water in the form of rain, if it all evaporates, the plants still have to be able to deal with the fact that there's actually very little precipitation. Arizona is a good example, by the way. Arizona has something like a monsoon climate. There actually is a fair amount of rain in Arizona, but it's so hot it all just evaporates right away. The plants still have to be able to deal with a limited amount of precipitation. Now, before we move on to the... I, because this list of these Kepin climate classifications gets kind of long, let me go ahead and ask you a third question as a little break here. It says, type B climates are usually farther from the equator than type A climates are. Yet type B climates are often hotter than the type A climates are, especially in the summer. Speculate as to why that would happen. Let me tell you the truth about this question. I think this question is hard. This question is harder than what I think is on the, and the questions in the test pool. But I want you to look through these answers and try to tell me why do you think... I mean, let me give you an example. There's jungles near the equator in, in, in um, Africa. Farther to the north, which you might think would be cooler, is the Sahara Desert, which is much, much hotter. Why do you think the Sahara Desert is hotter than those jungles down there closer to the equator? All right. Choose one of the links below this video to see if you're, and I'll give you some feedback of the answer.